Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Zena Arafat's debut novel, You Exist Too Much, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until now, after 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor. We want to thank all of you. Without our loyal community of book lovers and the time and work of authors like Zena and Roxanne, we would not be here today and we are truly appreciative of it. So tonight we are thrilled to have with us Zena Arafat for an event for the paperback release of You Exist Too Much. Zena is a LGBTQ Palestinian American writer based in Brooklyn. Her debut novel, You Exist Too Much was selected as an indie next pick for June and has been praised by O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, Vogue, Elle, Harper's Bazaar, NPR, Lit Hub, and Good Morning America. Her stories and essays have appeared in publications including Granta, The New York Times, The Believer, Virginia Quarterly Review, Vice, BuzzFeed, Guernica, and The Atlantic. She holds an MFA from Iowa and an MA from Columbia, and was awarded the 2018 Arab Women slash migrants from the Middle East Fellowship from Jack Jones Literary Arts. She teaches writing at Long Island University and the School of the New York Times and is currently working on an essay collection. Joining Zena in conversation is Roxanne Gay. Roxanne Gay's writing appears in Best American Mystery Stories 2014, Best American Short Stories 2012, Best Sex Writing 2012, a Public Space, McSweeney's, Tin House, Oxford American, American Short Fiction, Virginia Quarterly Review, and many others. She is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. She is the author of the books Aiti, An Untamed State, the New York Times bestselling Bad Feminist, the nationally bestselling Difficult Women, and the New York Times bestselling Hunger. She is also the author of World of Wakanda for Marvel. She has several books forthcoming and is also at work on television and film projects. She also has a newsletter, The Audacity. And so to begin with, we'll be beginning with a reading by Zena. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Zena Arafat to the stage. Hi, um, thank you so much uh, for being here, everyone. And thank you to The Strand and thank you to Roxanne. Uh, I'm just gonna read a few, mo a few minutes from um, from the book with no need for any setup. <laughs> I'll just start reading. <sighs> Where do you live? The professor wrote me. We'd met the previous summer, almost a year earlier. She taught French literature at the Alliance Francaise in Midtown East in between semesters at Columbia. On the first day of class, she had announced that past students had told her she didn't smile enough. So, she put her palms on the edge of the desk and leaned forward smiling as if to say, here you go. I'd loved her since the day she kept me after class and suggested I was too harsh on Emma Bovary for her childish fantasies. Emma's pathetic, sure, she said, pressing a polished fingernail to the word meprisable on my paper. From the dinosaur band-aid on that same finger, I surmised a husband and kids. But this is melodramatic, she said. She looked at me, paused, then offered an effortful smile. For the first time, I noticed the dimple that appeared above her lip when she smiled, like a second, smaller smile. While we stood there, I began to fall into its span. As I gathered up my things and walked towards the classroom door, she asked, is it so bad? I stopped and turned towards her. Is what so bad? To have an affair, she asked. Her question seared. It felt both suggestive and forgiving. At the time, a photo of Elliot Spitzer and his scorned wife, Silda, adorned the front page of the New York Post. I felt myself blush. I don't know, I said, but it is in this country. She laughed. Her laugh was deep and started in the back of her throat, getting increasingly lighter as it worked its way forward. True, she said. My body surged with heat. When I got home that night, I Googled her. I discovered that she wrote fiction. A short story with her byline came up, a simple piece about a woman struggling to keep her marriage intact as the other couples in their circle divorced. I wondered if it was based on truth and I searched for details that matched her reality as I knew it. 
During class the following week, I made a point to mention it. I read your story, I said, nervous to admit it and tingling with excitement, as though I had accessed some part of her that was now laid bare between us. Oh, she said. She nodded once, then offered the smile. Thank you. She appeared not to care whether I liked it, confident that it was good without my approval. Still, I felt encouraged to say, it would be nice to meet up sometime, maybe after the class is over. She nodded in return. It would. We met in early September at the Nespresso store in Midtown East, three blocks from our classroom. The conversation flowed. She talked about walking her daughter to school, her husband's startup, their vacation home in Saint Paul de Vence. I tried to match her level of privilege. I've been to Nice once, I said. I didn't mention that I had gone with Kate, my ex-girlfriend, towards the end of our relationship. I was worried that as a straight French woman, the entire concept of queerness would make her uncomfortable. We ordered cappuccinos. I resisted asking for skim milk so as not to seem too weight conscious or too American. I felt slightly tipsy as we left, though we hadn't drank any alcohol. When the bill came, I hesitantly asked if she would send me some of her unpublished writing to read. She placed her credit card on the table as I reached for my wallet, waving my hand away. You want to read more from me? She asked, sounding almost suspicious. I panicked. Until then, I felt emboldened, but her response was humbling. I thought I'd ask, I said, if that's okay. Sure, she said. She smiled again. It was starting to feel more natural any time she did so. I'm just surprised is all. We stepped outside the cafe, and as we walked off in different directions, I felt overwhelmed. I wanted her. I wanted her life. I wanted to live inside her life while still living inside my own. I wanted, above all, for her to like me. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, Zaina, it's great to be in conversation with you this evening. Thank you. It's so <laughs> lovely to be here with you. <laughs> that means a lot. Um, you know, it's always curious where to start, but I first read this novel quite some time ago, and I've not forgotten it. I absolutely loved it. And I'm always curious to how novelists come to the stories that they tell. So where does the idea for you exist too much begin? So um, first thing is I close my eyes when I think, so don't be alarmed. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the idea for the book stemmed from um, wanting to explore a theme of unattainability. And I was interested in the question of like, why is it that sometimes things that are off in the distance are more appealing than what's right in front of us? What's that about? And I, I initially thought to locate that question in love and in unrequited love in particular. Um, you know, and so I kind of created this character who sets her sights on women that are unattainable in some way. And I guess from there it grew the, the unattainability theme into like a sort of cultural unattainability where the character is Palestinian American and kind of exists between these two cultures and can't really access or attain one of one fully. You know, she's sort of neither nor in some way and desperately wanting to belong to, you know, either Palestinian her, her Palestinian culture or her American culture, but just not really attaining that. Then I guess it grew on a sort of macro level of unattainability in a political sense as a Palestinian and sort of the inability of attaining, you know, statehood, a uh, self-determination, a, a homeland that, you know, one is entitled to. And, you know, so all of that is really how it grew, you know? Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> that's where the idea came from. You know, there, there's a lot going on in this novel. I found it to be incredibly layered because the narrator is indeed contending with multiple occupied territories, like the literal territory of Palestine, and then the occupied territories of her life with her really fraught relationship with her mother, her fraught relationship with her lovers. And so a lot of the novel feels uh, unresolved in ways that are, I found deeply satisfying. And so how did you trust yourself as a writer and how did you trust the reader in, enough to have all of this lack of resolution in really every aspect of her life for most of the novel? Oh, I love that question. I, so great. It's a great question. I think 
Okay, I'll say that. So several reasons. One, I I love the essay as a form. Um, that's sort of my favorite form, and I've been, you know, and and I think the essay is a form that is an inquiry, and it's sort of a living, breathing question that you spend the whole essay trying to answer the question, but rarely do you get to the answer. It's just sort of all about the journey. And so in a way, I kind of wrote the book in the spirit of the essay, trusting that like, yeah, there is, as you say, a lot of sort of occupied territory and yet a lot of unresolvedness and like non tied up ends. And partly because it was, you know, an homage in some way to that form, or at least the form that I knew best, but like, and the form that felt most authentic, the most authentic way to tell the story, but also because so much of the book is about kind of, I don't know, break about destructive patterns of behavior. And I think, and about fraught relationships, especially with parents, you know, also with like one's heritage, one's collective cultural trauma. And, and in life, I mean, rarely do we find resolution to these things, you know, as much as we, as much therapy and what, what have you, we can go, we, that we go through. I mean, to fully transcend one's self and one's patterns is hard. You can make progress towards doing so, but somehow I think a full resolution on any of these fronts is just sort of unrealistic, and especially with like a mother-daughter relationship where, yeah, you can get closer to some form of like understanding, or maybe you can have some, you know, you can establish better boundaries that allow for better relationship, but to fully arrive at a place of like, you know, full resolution is just so unlikely. Um, and it just wouldn't have been like true to the character and to the, I don't know, the ideas beneath beneath it all if I had had a full resolution. So, so that's why, yeah, and then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the reality is that life rarely has the kinds of resolutions that we crave. Yeah. You know, yeah. you mentioned, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, no, it doesn't, sadly. <laughs> I wish it did. I wish it did. <laughs> you mentioned boundaries. And as I was reading, I know that there are parallels between you and the narrator. Mm -hmm. And so when you're writing fiction, where do the boundaries exist for you between fact and fiction? So, let me think. Um, the it's a great question. I think that what at least what I can say is this: is that like the germ of the or the germ. I don't know where that what that word even means in this context. Why people? But the the seed, I suppose, um, begins. I mean, you know, you don't. I, I think this the seed begins with some burning thing of truth in some way. Yeah, sure. like, why? Why else? Right. And I mean, at least for me. And um, and I think from there, you kind of have to just like, or at least for me, I had to kind of take that burning seed of truth and which often existed on the level of like identity in many ways, right? I mean, it's, I myself am a queer Palestinian American um, and there's a host of tensions surrounding that that I explore in the book as well through this character. But I think I have to sort of take that seed of burning truth kind of close my eyes and really um, shed away all of the reality surrounding my own experience, or at least as much of it I as I can, and locate the story in imagined scenarios, right? And like, sometimes I do that by taking a fantasy I have and making it real through writing it, or uh, kind of like, oh, what if this were to happen? And, you know, making it happen, but like, really it's so hard i think to or at least one of the challenges certainly is like pushing past truth and the burning truth underlying the desire to tell the story and moving it into an imagined world um such that it isn't just you know such that it's fiction um yeah so so that's um i guess that's kind of how i think of it i mean a lot of like eye closing and like forgetting and like reimagining and recasting and like yeah um so so yeah i don't know if that answers the question and really it does actually you know i mean as someone who writes both fiction and nonfiction, a yeah. lot of times people think my fiction is thinly veiled but it mm -hmm. actually isn't mm -hmm. at all it's completely made up and um as is the nature of the genre. 
And right. so I'm always curious when I'm talking to other writers who write in both genres about how do you manage that negotiation between truth and fiction, especially when readers have this expectation that even fiction is truth. And it's like, it's truth in one sense, right. but not in the sense that you're thinking. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and so maybe even the shape of fiction like allows you to move away from truth in some sense. I mean, how can you you have to take it, create a story with like compelling moments and an arc and all that and like life rarely lends itself to that either too. So like yeah, um it's funny when people say thinly veiled cuz I'm like, wow, I would be quite a fascinating human being if I had done that. <laughs> right? I wish I was half as interesting as my protagonist. I know. Um, exactly. like, the truth is not that interesting. I'm like watching Bravo and right. drinking lemonade. Like, that's it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Likewise. I've just been in this apartment all year. So, mm -hmm. much. That's, <laughs> that's funny. One of the most compelling things for me in the novel was just like at a language level, which I thought this was beautifully, beautifully written. And there were a lot of these um, sort of double meanings throughout, like uh, early in the novel, the narrator says, in acquiring my gender, I had become offensive. And, you know, you could take that both like as offensive or offensive. And I loved that moment. And there were so many throughout the novel. And I was curious, how do you think about and play with language in your writing? I mean, language is everything, isn't it? Like, it's like so much of the writing of the book is just debating language choices over and over and over and, and, and what have you. And I, I mean, I, I think that, um, I think that I wanted to achieve a degree of, I mean, I hoped to achieve a degree of sort of lyricism because of the fact I think I want to okay God, I'm loving these questions they're so thought-provoking like truly I wanted the language to mimic some aspect of the character's mentality whereas it, so this character is super romanticizing of other people other places you know um things that like are intangible in some way and so as a result I think I often wrote in language that was sort of whims like lyrical or at least like I don't know like rose colored language in some way such that I I remember times where a certain like reader or you know editor might come to this and be like oh you could just say this sentence like this and have it be just sort of more direct and straightforward but it's like oh no because the whole point is to like really capture her mindset through the language and the way that like she sees things so romantically um and yeah, I love that you pointed to that line, right? In acquiring my gender, I had become offensive. I had become offensive. And I I also, I mean, things like that, I really did, at I hoped that it would, I don't know, land. And I guess sometimes it did. I'm sure other times it didn't. But like, I, I know that sometimes there were lines that wanted to be, yeah, cut. And I was like, no, 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 because I, I want, that's like a wink of some sort. And I hope that some readers will get that. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, and then also I guess the problem of like, or the issue of, not the problem, but like the decisions of when to use words in different, in Arabic without translation and whatnot was also like kind of a thing when thinking about language and sort of trusting that the reader didn't need to understand everything, but that they could still understand without having to understand everything, if that makes sense. Sure, you know, I think that's one of the challenges and in, in, in a good way uh, about language and writing is thinking about how much information you need to give the reader for them to understand no matter what language you're writing in yeah. and as someone who also does not provide translations mm -hmm. in my work like if you don't speak french or Creole, i just don't know what to tell you but um i speak english so <laughs> you know it, it's um i think it's a good choice for people to make because if you're doing your job well, people can get the gist of what it is that you're saying. And it also just acknowledges that we live in a complex world where people speak many, many different languages and that those languages matter. Okay. And so you didn't do translations. And I was curious as to, did you get pushback from that? Because sometimes editors get it and sometimes they don't. 
I will say my editor got it, you know, he was not at all sort of resisting that. And um, I was very lucky in that way. And I really appreciated that. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't in that, in that regard. Yeah, I didn't. So, or in that regard, I didn't. Yeah, great. Yeah. I, I connected, I think, a lot to this book because the narrator is a third culture kid who is really navigating a a homeland and the land to which her family has emigrated and queerness in a straight world. And uh, I was wondering if you were thinking about that in developing this narrator and also developing the circumstances in which she not only found herself, but frankly put herself. Yeah, you mean like um, if I was navigating the sort of third culture kid aspect when navigating these scenarios and navigating the queerness and yeah, sorry, I just have to repeat the question so I can fully, as I think about it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? Like I, so I remember once, yeah, I, so yes. And, and let me just think about how to answer this. Absolutely. And so much of her being a third culture kid and a sort of like is present in the way she conducts her life and the and her mindset in so many ways, right? So like for one thing, sometimes third culture kids or at least my generation of third culture kids, there was a lot of kind of alienation in some sense because you know you didn't really you were in this like other part of the diagram, this other little circle that was sort of separate from the big circle. And um, so as a result, this character is really alienated in ways where, you know, her career, uh, she's a D career, her, she's a DJ. That is a very lonely thing. You're just like in a booth by yourself and you're on a totally different like time frame than everybody else. She doesn't really have a queer community and um, and is sort of, just like as a result, sort of lurking in the shadows. Uh, I mean, in addition to the fact that she's kind of internally homophobic, she's also, and coming to terms with accepting herself, she's also sort of lurking in the back, in the shadows and asymmetrically falling in love with people rather than actually, you know, engaging with other queer people. And she's also, the other like sort of third culture kid aspect that's maybe like the biggest circle is the way that she's always sort of longing um, and I think so much of being a third culture kid is about longing because like you crave the place, I mean, to the extent that you experience like your parents' home country, um, you really long for that when you're outside of that place. And when you're in that place, you long for the other place, right? Because you're just so much you're just so in between those. You're just so much um, neither nor in some way. And so that longing really is, I mean, her defining feature, I think. She's just always in a state of longing. I was thinking about it recently because I've been really myself missing Palestine a lot. And I was like, I wonder what it's like to not constantly miss somewhere else that's so hard <laughs> to get to. But but yeah, I think I think longing is what defines her behavior and what defines the way that she moves through all of these spaces, um, as well as like alienation and um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, her longing was very, it was at times poignant and <laughs> at times frustrating mm. that even when she seemingly had good things in front of her, she was still looking beyond them to sort of what more there could be to fill this void. And so, you know, she seemed to always be searching for something to either give her a sense of connectedness or place or fulfillment. How did you think about her hungers um, as you wrote her character? I mean, her appetites are drive her. And I mean, appetite is a big part of the book in so far as, um, as you say, right? She's, she's constantly searching. And I, I, I suppose, and, and then I'm just gonna, okay, so on the sort of like literal level of appetite, she at some point in her life kind of has anorexia and has this sort of like deprivation of, you know, or denying her, her appetite in some way. And I think that in, she does the same thing kind of throughout where she denies, she, you know, craves intimacy, healthy intimacy or intimacy and doesn't know 
And yet at the same time, does everything she can to sort of thwart it by engaging in these sort of destructive behavioral patterns in, in love and also like falling in love with people that are unavailable or unattainable and that can't love her back. And so like this sort of frustrated appetite is, it leads obviously to like constant searching and she can't seem to like, and constant hunger and she can't seem to recognize, break out of this pattern. And I mean, where does this like, Thwarted, why does one thwart one's appetites? I, I suppose there's a degree of self-loathing or wanting to self-negate. Um, and, and, and yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, so it like, it can be, as you said, really frustrating to watch her searching, especially when she has a good thing right in front of her, right? Mm -hmm. And yet this is like the pattern that she knows because she's so used to sort of de deprivation and, um, and, and kind of removing herself as soon as she gets close to fulfilling an appetite from having that appetite be fulfilled. Um, it's like self-sabotaging. So, yeah. yeah. Given all of that, I was surprised by the ending where <laughs> she kind of ends up in an unexpected place where despite the yearning, despite the truly horrifically bad decisions and and the sort of connections with unavailable people, she does end up in a place that is at least for the moment satisfying. Mm -hmm. And like she comes to this understanding that she finally has something worth protecting. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love when a writer surprises me. And so did you know from the beginning that she would end in this place or was that something that evolved as you wrote the novel? You know, I had no idea each, I, ne I never knew what was going to happen next. I would just like literally sit down, write, and, or I'd be so excited to sit down and write so I could find out what, what she was going to do. And um, at a, I think that at a certain point, there was like, before she ends up in that relationship, I think she, you know, the arc is such that she kind of, you know, <laughs> she descends and then like, kind of seem, you know, works towards getting better. And then it seems like she's getting better. And then she like, boom, sort of descends again into some horrible decision. And you're just like, oh my goodness. And, and then there's a moment after where she faces yet another kind of decision. And I think she ever so slightly moves in the right direction. But then I wanted to like lead her or, I, or I, I actually didn't lead her. I felt like she led herself into a scenario that was, you know, it wasn't like, I, I, I didn't think of it as like fireworks of, you know, healthiness and goodness and recovery. But at the same time, it was like, yeah, pretty stable place and like something resembling healthy intimacy. And I, I just think that she did somehow on her own end up there by virtue of like, the sort of cost of all these decisions finally adding up and sort of resonating in her mind. And, and really, I mean, really, I think that so much of what just uh, drives her decisions and often is, is her relationship with her mother and like her sort of internalized homophobia. And I think that the progress she, I think one trajectory of the novel is that between her and her mother and like her coming to understand her mother and form empathy and compassion and the mother coming to understand the daughter and form sort of, you know, empathy and compassion. And as that relationship evolves, so is the narrator able to form, make better decisions and form like healthier relationships to some extent. Um, so, yeah. And I think I just wanted to leave it there and not know what would happen next if she would, if something destructive would happen or not. But, um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of an exciting thing when you just don't quite know what's going to happen next. You know what's going to happen now, and that's that. Yeah, totally. And, you know, like whatever the wherever the reader takes it on their own time is where they take it on their own time, which is, I think, one of the pleasures of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, who were some of your influences? Uh, because I felt like there were a few different influences at work in the prose. So mm -hmm. I'm curious as to what kind of writers shaped not only your thinking in terms of how you approach this write this novel, but your craft overall? Yeah, I mean, it's such a hard question because there were so many, you know, and I was just saying to Sabir that like, unless my bookshelf is right in front of my face, I can never remember the names of things, but I'm just looking at it behind me, or at least some of the ones that I have because the rest are in storage. 
it's been a very transient time, but um, until now. But um, I <laughs> so, so, truly. So my big okay, at the risk of sounding like some pretentious moron, like my impl- two biggest influences in some way, like were. I love Proust's use of like automatic memory and the way that he sort of moves through the present and the past. Um, And that was really influential to me um, in Search of Lost Time. And then I really liked Flaubert because I love Emma Bovary as a character. And I just like really like the creation of a character who is in some ways just like tragic and hard to watch. And then more contemporary, you know, speaking, I really love a lot of essayists like I love Maggie Nelson. I really like Eula Biss. I love Claudia Rankine's work. I love I, I, I love um, other writers that are you know writing sort of auto fictiony type stuff. Like I, I like Jenny Zhang's work. I think she's a great like poet and great um, uh, fiction writer. I like um, I like Ben Lerner. I like. Um, um, Edward Said is a huge influence just in terms of the ideas uh, of, you know, in Orientalism and just how, just sort of thinking about the gaze and, and just sort of, I don't know, I thought about this narrator really having like a sort of gaze that she kind of projects onto others. But, um, and yeah, like tons and tons and tons of other writers that I was really fortunate and other writers that like I had never encountered until I got to my MFA program. And there were just so many different, just, just like a whole world of um, work that was really exciting to me beyond all of what I just listed. Um, But yeah, there's so many more. I'm, I'm, I, I, yeah, I, I was, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're never going to get them all in one in one sitting, which is totally totally fine. Um, what, I noticed that you had a quotation from Kierkegaard. At oh, the Kierkegaard. Beginning. Yeah, and I loved um, "Pleasure disappoints, possibility never," mm-hmm. which I think if you had to have a four-word encapsulation of the novel, it would be that. And it's rare that an epigraph actually <laughs> works. <laughs> Yeah. but this one actually worked um how did you settle on it did you or and did you co- did you come to the epigraph before or after or during the writing process? i love that question so it's a fu- so funny i totally forgot that actually the biggest influence of this the what for me i was a philosophy major and i i so i love kierkegaard and um and i i sort of actually initially the book was really sort of idea driven and then I took away a lot of the philosophy and made it more sorry but that epigraph was like I think the very first thing that I wrote which is what I think led to like coincided with this interest in unattainability because right pleasure disappoints possibility never basically it's like saying the unattainable is more appealing than the actual and I had remember I had the epigraph like taped above my desk and I just sort of let it trickle into the writing and um, and I'm glad that you you know I guess liked it or appreciate it because I feel like yeah I love I love the epigraph and I think sometimes people you can like skip past the epigraph but I feel like it's such a like key to the book in some way um, so so yeah yeah that's that's the epigraph. <laughs> uh, if those of you watching have questions, please feel free to ask your questions using the ask a question feature. Um, and I will absolutely be sure to ask your questions to Zaina or pose your questions, I should say. Um, uh, I, whenever I'm asked this question, I'm always like, oh, I don't fucking know. But I'm still going to ask it. Um, what what are you reading right now that you're liking? <laughs> I know, right? Um, that's it's so hard. I'm like, I, I just, I could, I, I am reading things I love, but right. I'm not like great at remembering names. I've actually taken to um, having a little post-it with uh, me when I do events. Anyway. I used to do that. So, okay, several books that I've been reading. I read, um, one of the last books that I read in love was Joss Lake's Future Feeling, and it's published by Soft Skull, and it's it's just like the mo- one of the most original novels I've read in a very long time. I loved it. I am reading, um, I'm, I'm actually reading Normal People by Sally Rooney right now, just 
very delicious read. I am reading Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine um, Evaristo, which won the Booker Prize at some point and is very, very unique in its sort of structure and lack of like punctuation and it's really cool. And um, and I guess I was reading, um, I mean, these are not, no one cares to hear that I'm reading like Zadie Smith essays. <laughs> Zadie Smith doesn't need any more sort of readers, but I was just reading Feel Free and um, I feel very much enjoying that. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been reading. Uh, yeah. I uh, loved Girl, Woman, Other. It's, it's so startlingly good because at first I read it and I was like, what is this with all of this atypical structure and the lack of punctuation and just sort of all of the non-traditional narrative devices that she used but that that book is readable like a motherfucker i just like once you figure out how to read it it's like this is really good and I, I did not want that book to end um i love anyway. books that, like i know i love books that sort of set their own rules and it's like you have to figure out how to play the game and then like once you learn the rules you are just like obsessed with it so yeah it's really bold it's such a bold thing to do it's so just impressive it really is and i think it takes a real confidence even if it, you don't always have that confidence as a writer and i always tell my students like you can do whatever you want you can break all of the rules but you have to be able to teach your reader how to go forward um and so how do you take risks in your work if at all oh yeah um i guess so uh i feel like that it's it's funny because I, I sometimes feel like i took so many risks with this book and i'm like how did i have the ability to do that and why um so there's the risk in terms of like structure because it has a really unconventional structure that i was really committed to um because it, it just sort of non-linear and really just sort of circular in ways and 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 i had this one moment of self-doubt about it where i took I, I i had sent the query letter to an agent she wrote back and said she'd love to see the manuscript I, I took the structure and made it, I got, I panicked and made it all linear. And then I sent it to her and then she wrote back and was like, oh, I read it, I really like it, but something feels off, let's meet and talk. We met and talked and she was like, was there a different structure before? And I told her, I was like, how did you know that? And I told her and she's like, oh, that sounds way better. And that was just like so validating. And um, we ended up working together, her name's Michelle Brower. And, um, and so I guess I knew I wanted to take that risk, but I guess I needed a little push in the right direction. And then, you know, also my editor, Jonathan Lee, you know, loved the structure too. And, you know, kind of helped me to sort of smooth out some of the like, um, some of the like less fluid transitions, which was really, really helpful and great. And then in terms of content, obviously there's a lot there. I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a good, I'm a, I'm a, at the end of the day, I'm a Palestinian Muslim girl. And, um, and it was scary to put a book into the world that is about, you know, queerness and about culture and family and the sort of intersections between all of these and like there's sex in the book and like, um, and I remember that early on in the process we were in workshop and everyone was asking, you know, our workshop leader, um, like, well, Jeff Dyer was the leader and he was like, we asked him like, well, what do you do about, you know, these fears of you know people reading your work and like your family reading your work and he he said like oh oh calm down like most of your work will be met with resounding silence and i found it so comforting you know like maybe it was an insult to all of us but i was like oh amazing i don't even have to worry about that so i just stopped waking up at 4 a.m in like a cold sweat and just wrote what i wanted to write as if there would never be a reader. And I think I visualized the end result. I had like all these delusions of like grandeur the whole time that helped me push past the fears that came with the risks and, and, um, and yeah, so <laughs> that was sort of how, and then also the overhanging reality that one day we'll all be dust is always really helpful to me when it comes to taking any risk. So I'm just like, oh yeah, at the end of the day, nothing matters. Um, so yeah. Um, it's funny you should say that. Like, I always, always write like, uh, no one's going to read my work. And I genuinely tell my, even now, I tell myself, like, okay, girl, it doesn't matter what you put in this little essay here. Uh, no one's going to read it and, and, and it's going to be fine. Yeah. And I know that it's a delusion. And of course, the older I get, it, the harder it is 
to maintain that delusion, but still, it's what comforts me while I'm writing. I love that you can still do that, even though you are obviously like so widely read, it's unbelievable. <laughs> but but well, I, I, sure, I sure can't can do it. I'm just like, it's fine, girl. No one's gonna read this. No one's gonna read it at all. It's totally fine. Um, has your family read your work? Um, no. Good job. Well done. No, I don't. Knock on wood. Shoot, I hope they don't now like read. Do they know you wrote a book. Uh, yeah, they do. Oh. So, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure I have like cousins and things, but not, I mean, I don't want to jinx it. So yeah, but they knock on wood. Yeah. Writing is, is a nice little like, if, if I made a movie, it would be easier to watch it. So like reading, writing a book, it's a little hard, it takes more investment to sort of sit down and read it. So yeah. For sure. Um. <laughs> I told my parents, especially with my last book, I was like, don't read it. And, Cause they never listen when I tell them not to read my work, they read it anyway. And so with hunger, I was like, don't read it. Here's why. That way you don't feel like curious to like go do some shit that's gonna upset you. And it worked this time. The first time in my life they've listened to me. Oh, that's magic. That's wonderful. Oh, it's so, it's so yeah. great. And they've been to hunger events, like they come to my book events and so on. So, you know, they do know everything that they need to know, but um, it's so freeing when your family doesn't read your work. I'm like, I don't come to your job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like sit over your court, like your shoulder while you're like doing your yeah, your job for crying out loud. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, Malik asks, as third culture kids, how do we practice inhabiting our stories ourselves? Okay, so so yeah, as third culture kids, how do we practice inhabiting our stories ourselves? As third culture kids, how do we practice inhabiting our stories ourselves? I mean, that's a great question. I I guess um, well, one helpful way, okay, two a few ways really. One is to acknowledge that okay, you're a third culture kid. The second way is to like find a community of third culture kids because like it's a very I think it's helpful to like hear other people's stories and towards the end of inhabiting your own story. Um, and then the third is to like write about your story, you know, um, as much as you sort of can access the moments of being a third culture kids that you like feel yourself feeling a little like feeling something when you go near that moment. Um, I think it's a good place to try sort of writing from. And then in that way, you're sort of inhabiting that space. But community is really important when it comes to third culture kids-ness. And now there are just so many of us. And I think it really helps us to sort of feel empowered and take ownership over our narratives. And I love that. So, so yeah, great question. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but Nizar, or Nizar asks, was there anything you cut from the novel you, that you regret cutting? Um, oh, no you think you're gonna regret cutting things, right? Because at the time you're like, I love this chapter or I love this line. But what you do is like, you take that cut and you put it in another Word document that's like, you know, that I call it like cuts, <laughs> whatever. And so like, not really cutting it, it's still there. I'm just putting it in a different like bedroom. And, um, and then you find that you never miss it. I mean, I remember I had a different, I did cut a chapter that came after the last chapter and um, I'm so glad I did because it was, I just like where the book ends, but at the time I was sort of uncertain. So no, no, no regrets about cutting anything. I think it's rare that a writer regrets cutting something for whatever reason. I mean, your mind just sort of forgets the thing you cut um, with all of the process of like editing and writing a book and all the stuff that comes with it. You just like, you just forget it. So, um, but if it's something you love and, and you don't want to cut it and like someone's telling you to cut it, I feel like you should, argue for it um you no know? so yeah that i think sometimes like 10 people out of 10 people are like i think you should cut this and then you're like maybe i should but if you really love it and even if 10 people out of 10 people are telling you to cut it don't cut it as much as you can fight for it and justify it try yeah i think you should stick to your you know it's you trust your instincts i i think that's so important like sometimes you know and you might even be wrong but there, there are worse things than being wrong. And it's so funny, I too save everything I cut from my work. I put it in a, a file called I Still Love You. Oh. 
So I go back, like, especially when I need, it might be useful somewhere else. I go back and get it. But also sometimes I just go and visit, like, on my little graveyard of unused sentences that are beautiful. <laughs> love you. I still love you. It's so good. Just go and pet them every now and then. Yeah, it's like, so they know, like, you are loved, even yeah. if you are not used. They mm -hmm. like it. Right. Absolutely. Um, Ashley asks, and I didn't, there's a word missing. Were there any significant blank faced when writing this story? And I'm going to guess challenges <laughs> is what the missing word is. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can pretend that that's the word. I think that must be the word, right? Yeah. And the answer I think, like, given the context, that, that must be the word. The answer is yes. Um, okay. Many. Starting with, like, you know, losing momentum at times and trying to like keep that up. Um, isolation and loneliness, Facebook and watching other people's lives happen while you're sitting in a room writing all the time. Um, rejection when you like, you know, send out chapters to an agent and they aren't into it. Um, the, the, so those are some of just some of the obstacles <laughs> that I say it's, I would I faced sensitivity when like you know you have workshop and you hear all this criticism and you're like <laughs> they don't even know and and then you realize like a few days later that actually it's all going to be okay and it's really helpful then for me some of the obstacles that came with the sort of like path to publication were um, various industry people kind of wanting it to be a different thing wanting it to be more like um, having more like spices from the marketplace or more like women in hijabs or just more like more violence, more kind of con more camels, <laughs> seriously. But like, I was really lucky to find an agent and, and an editor and a publishing house that like didn't want that at all and just saw the story for what I was trying to do, which was like a story, a love story in some sense, but also with the backdrop of like Palestine and the Middle East and all of that. But like, so that was, you know, those were the central kind of obstacles. And yes, indeed, there are obstacles. And I think writing is so much about like persistence. Um, persistence implies that there are going to be obstacles, right? Because you have to persist through them. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Alex from Facebook asks, did you learn anything about yourself while writing this book, given the commonalities between you and the protagonist? I did. I did indeed. That like as a in as a first generation you know first generation kid a third culture kid um, I do long <laughs> um, in ways that are kind of integral to both that reality and also perhaps the reality of being in a diaspora especially a Palestinian diaspora um, I I learned that. And I, and I could also see the sort of downside of that as well from, you know, watching the character and, and, and along with its sort of inevitability. Um, and I mean, there were other sort of realizations, I suppose, along the way um, that struck me. But I think that was one of them was just like learning so much about what it really means to be like the children, the child of, in, of immigrants, and Palestinian immigrants in particular. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Indran asks, can you talk about literature and Palestinian independence? What role should the writer play? What role should the what play? The writer. Oh, the role of writer should be like the most subversive weapon of any, you know, resistance movement. Um, I think that that's what's, what writing is, is it's, it's such a, it's an act of resistance mm -hmm. in a it's like a subversive act of resistance because it doesn't always appear as such. It doesn't come wielding like weapons. And it's incredibly, I mean, the best way I think to achieve independence or maybe the only way at this point is to change minds. Right. And I think that's what writers do, but have to, and, and I think with fiction, what's so great about it is like with nonfiction, you kind of address things head on and oftentimes people resist that, you know, because they're like, okay, I don't want someone coming in here and trying to change how I think. With fiction, you kind of do that subversively um, where you introduce characters and realities that are, you know, stories and they seem very like friendly in some sense, but they really are sort of subconsciously, I think, infiltrating your mind and like impacting your thinking. So yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly a relationship between literature and resistance and, you know, seeking independence and 
um, it's a part of it is what brought me to writing in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. How long did it take, uh, this is from Winnie, how long did it take to go from your first draft to the published version? And were there major ways the story changed during that process? Um, the whole sort of structure didn't actually change all that much, but it was like, I, I but it was filled in. I mean, like all the meat was like, was like juiced up and all that, Like, but like, the sort of structure didn't really change, but it grew. But then like at the, from the first draft to the like, you know, final draft that like went to copy edits, I guess it took, I don't know, do I tell the truth or do I do I lie and make it less? Um, I took like mm, maybe five or six years, uh, six years, I think, total, all in all. Yeah, took time. Um, and that's hard because it's also time of your life, but you're doing other things in the, pro in, the, in the process too. But yeah, I would say honestly about six years. So. Last, but certainly, well, I have two last questions. Okay. Uh, what is the next thing that you're working on, if anything? I'm working on an essay collection mm -hmm. and I'm also working on another novel um, and they are different than this novel but they explore a lot of similar themes when it comes to diaspora and um, kind of forging a sense of home and um, all of that. And yeah, I get shy when I talk about what I'm working on next for whatever reason, but I'm working on an essay collection and a novel, yeah. Um, my final question is a question I actually love to ask writers and creative people. And uh, that question is, what do you like most about your writing? I like, what do I like most about my writing? I, what I like, I love that question. I've never thought about it. What do I like most about my writing? Not what do I like most about writing? I, I, what I like most about my writing, I feel like my writing, um, for one thing, surprises itself. I love that. I really, really love the element of surprise that I think accompanies my writing. And I, and I love, I think that my writing takes sort of is take risks, takes risks and is sort of original in the way that it is on the sentence level and maybe on the sort of overall shape of it as well. I really do like those things about my writing um, and the sort of themes that it explores, I guess. I, that's a great question and it makes me like blush to answer it. I don't think anyone's ever asked it to me, but it's, it's a lovely question. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I like to ask it. I mean, we're always told to like, not told, but so many writers make, an unfortunate habit of self-deprecation to their own detriment. And it's fine. I mean, we're all full of self-loathing, but surely there's one thing you enjoy about the work you put into the world. And so I'm always curious what that thing might be. So I appreciate your answering my question and for joining me in this really wonderful conversation about your startlingly, uh, strikingly beautiful novel. You exist too much. Oh, there's my camera. See? Yes. And um, I just hope that everyone buys a copy of it in either hardback or paperback out now. And um, yes. I just say thank you so much for this incredible conversation, Roxanne. It has meant so much to me and has just been so soul filling. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And thanks to The Strand as well for hosting us. It's been just so, what a lovely evening. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you both so much for such an interesting and compelling conversation. I really enjoyed the last hour. Uh, to our audience, if you haven't purchased the book yet, you can get a signed one by pressing the green button center of your screen. Zaina will be coming in tomorrow to sign them, so please feel free. And then to everyone else, uh, thank you for spending your evening with us and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thanks again.